Hi guys, this is GSNO.com and I'm here with the Samsung Galaxy A20e. It's a version that has been derived from the A20 and you're going to find it most of all in Europe, but also in several other areas. This is the cheapest One UI phone I've ever tested. Uh, and it's not actually the cheapest in the world. There's also the A10, but for now the A20e is the most affordable we could find. It's a 5.8 inch phone with a dual back camera. It also had a wide angle lens and it's priced at only $150. And at the same time, it sacrifices the AMOLED screen for, well, something else. It's pretty compact. It feels like the Galaxy A40 we recently reviewed. And in many ways, it's an A40 Lite. So let's start the review. On the design front, it's all plastic. I wouldn't even uh, dare to say it's 3D plastic, but let's call it that since the other Galaxy A phones were called under that name. I'm talking about the material, which is basically plastic, glossy plastic, made to look like glass. Plastic at the back, plastic at the sides, and glass at the front, obviously. Now, the footprint of the phone is very familiar. It's very much the same with the one we had on the Galaxy A40, meaning it's very easy to use with a single hand and it's also uh, easily usable when it comes to the buttons, they have a pretty nice feedback. However, this time around, I feel that the phone is a bit more slippery and also the back side is a bit smudgy, so if you have uh, dirty fingers or you have grease on your hands, you'll see that on the back side. Other than that, responsive buttons, easy one hand use, pretty nice ergonomics, comfortable phone, just be careful so it won't slip. And if you want measurements, 8.4 millimeters in thickness, 141 grams in weight, and it's a 5.8 inch diagonal we're dealing with here. Aside from the blue version you see here, there's also a black one, white one, and the coral one, which is frankly my favorite. Now on the display front, what you're seeing here is a 5.8 inch panel with a resolution of 1560 over 720 pixels. It's actually a TFT LCD screen, definitely no AMOLED. It's got the whole Infinity V thing and the cutout for the selfie camera here. And I would say that the bezels are big-ish and also slightly curved to the sides. Now I am going to keep things atypical this time around and instead of showing you the usual stuff, the usual test video, I'm going to show you one of our sister side videos because it's pretty cool and I'm actually loving it. Uh, it's a camera sample, cinematic camera sample done with the aid of the Xperia 1 and it's pretty breathtaking. As Ken Reeves would say, you're breathtaking. Okay, we go here. I'm going to set the resolution to 720p. That's how we roll and let's enjoy it. So uh, I'm actually using this sample to put the screen to the test. And I have to say we're dealing here with a pretty, pretty vividly colored screen. Not as vivid as an AMOLED for sure, but reasonably bright. There are also wide view angles. Okay, and uh, it feels a bit more washed out than an AMOLED. That's what I can say. It's clearly below the Galaxy A40, even though the brightness is not bad. And also the contrast in the sunlight, not that bad. The pixels have an RGB stripes arrangement. And now we go further and see what we achieved here. So we put the screen under the microscope. This is the pixel arrangement of the RGB straps variety. And then we did a brightness test with the lux meter, achieving a level of 472 lux units, which is actually not bad at all. It's superior to the Galaxy S10 Plus and the Zenfone 6, but inferior to the Galaxy A50 and A40, as well as the Nokia 5. You also have some special settings for the screen. You can tweak them here, display, you got your brightness, adaptive brightness, night mode, phone size and style, screen zoom, full screen apps, screen timeout, home screen, easy mode, and the navigation bar, and a few other options. In the end, I would say it's reasonable for the price tag, and it's okay for a TFT LCD. Now, uh, before we talk about anything else, I'm going to start a game because I don't want to bore you with just moving around through apps and the screen. It's PUBG Mobile. It's not the light one, it's the full one. So I'm going to talk about the specs, performance and benchmarks while playing PUBG on a $150 phone. The CPU we have here is an octa-core Exynos 7884, clocked at 1.6 GHz, which is also spotted on the Galaxy A20, A10 and A10e. There's also 3 GB of RAM here, 32 GB of storage, micro SD card slot and there's no lag per se even though when you're starting up the phone and it's doing updates you may experience some sluggishness. We also played games, we played this one, 
We played Asphalt 9, we played Riptide GP Renegade, and now I want to talk about the benchmarks for a bit. So I'm going to start off with uh, Antutu 7. In Antutu 7 we beat HTC U11 Live, and we also beat uh, the Nokia 6.1 and the Xperia XA2. At the same time we scored below the Galaxy A40 and below the Motorola Moto G7 Power. In Geekbench 4 Multicore we beat the Huawei P20 Lite and the Galaxy A6 2018 uh, and at the same time we scored below the Moto G6 and the Zenfone 3. So not exactly impressive but still out there. Okay so this is a showcasing of PUBG, the regular one, not the light one. We start off with a bit of lag but then as we play things get better and the simple fact you can run it uh, gives me a bit of courage and I imagine that the light version which recently debuted in India talking about the light version of the game plays even more smoothly now I talked about Geekbench 4 just before and now I feel it's time to talk about the graphical benchmarks but before that I have to focus here and maybe do some killing okay so apparently I killed someone with my MP 416 but probably going to get killed okay that's it in a nutshell a quick first impression of a PUBG on an affordable phone the simple fact it runs it is good news okay uh, going further from that I promised you graphical benchmarks so we got slingshot here slingshot ES 3.1 it's superior to the Motorola Moto G7 power Motorola one and the Xiaomi Mi A2 Lite but inferior to the Galaxy A40 and the Nokia 5.1 plus you may be wondering about the temperature we also measure that and here we have 32.9 degrees Celsius achieved in GFX bench and uh, which is a benchmark and in gaming 36.5 degrees Celsius in Riptide GP Renegades so overall not bad there was no overheating here and the fact we can play the game is always a good piece of news now we're going to go further and talk about the battery it sounds okay for the diagonal 3000 mAh battery and on paper we're being promised 14 hours of video playback now let's see how we did okay so let's see how we did in the video test of course you have screenshots quite a lot of them and uh, first of all I'm going to start with the continuous HD video playback so this one clocks at 11 hours and 48 minutes which is pretty impressive it beats the Motorola one and also the Huawei P30 Lite scores below the Galaxy A40 and A50 with the A50 actually beating it by four hours this is the video playback basically your movie watching time we also have continuous usage which is actually more impressive basically it could as well be gaming 11 hours and 4 minutes it beats the galaxy s10 plus and galaxy s10e believe it or not scores below the galaxy a50 and the xiaomi mi a2 Lite. i was actually shocked by the charging one hour and 34 minutes not bad and after one hour you're at about 72 percent we have the standard power saving options here like um, optimized medium power save and max power save plus the adaptive power save and then we move on to the acoustic experience which is served by a singular speaker here at the bottom. You'd be tempted to say that you're going to cover it in landscape mode, only not totally, so uh, mixed in ergonomics speaker behavior. We have a Dolby Atmos setting, which can also be found here. As far as I know, here it is, Dolby Atmos, and if you go deeper into the settings, you should be able to find more options for your acoustics. And we have them here, sound quality, Dolby Atmos, an equalizer for genres, and adapt sound. Now, I gave up on uh, making you listen songs on the device because I have a microphone and doesn't always go through. Anyways, the phone comes with an audio jack. It also has FM radio and a bunch of cheap plastic headphones. And my actual experience when using the phone for music purposes is that we have a modest volume, a mid-level bass, and the case vibrates a bit. I would have to say that the voices are pretty warm and it's okay, but not my favorite in the low mid-range department and we also have a decibel meter test to attest to that so let me go here and the first test is this one 84.8 decibels this was achieved with a typical acoustic sample it's superior to the Huawei P30 Lite and Galaxy S10 Plus inferior to the Galaxy A40 and A70 when it comes to the games we played Riptide GP Renegade and we achieved 93.6 decibels which is underwhelming i've seen phones go past the 100 decibel mark it beats the motorola x4 and the huawei p10 Lite, 
it's below the Galaxy A40 by almost 10 decibels, so definitely could have been better. Now on the camera front, I told you before, we're doing, dealing with a dual affair. The top camera is a 5 megapixel ultra wide shooter, bottom camera 13 megapixel f1.9 aperture, LED flash, and at the front in this notch here, there's an 8 megapixel shooter. We even have a selfie focus, we have live focus in the mix, smart beauty, a pro mode, and even a bunch of stickers. I won't insist too much on that, I'm going to skip straight to the gallery. And believe it or not, I was actually pretty impressed. These are daytime shots taken on a very sunny day with some clouds here and there. And let's be honest, they're actually not very far from the Galaxy A40 and the Galaxy A50. And also they're less burnt, they're less oversaturated compared to what I saw on the Huawei P30 Lite. I know this sounds like a blasphemy for many people. It's not a blasphemy. Uh, if I'm being honest, the Huawei P30 Lite burns the shots more. So. This is a regular shot. This is the ultra wide shot. It tends to deform the image a bit. It creates a bit of a tunnel effect, but it may just be me. That also happened to me on the Galaxy A40, so it's nothing new. I'm loving the hues of red and blue. They're kept natural and realistic. Uh, the green ones may be a bit deformed by the brightness of the sun. Oh, this is actually a video, excuse me. So as I said before, uh, the green hues may be deformed a bit by the strength of the sun. So reds are okay, blues are okay, greens not all the time. Now we go to the selfies which just like on the Galaxy A40 and A50 not stunning just okay and be sure to find a proper angle so the sun wouldn't be too strong or too dim. Anyways okay facial texture and the eyes are once again doll like but for some reason I actually grew to like the selfie focus effect. This is it. What's behind me is blurred and somehow the eyes look a bit more realistic this time around. So selfie focus is actually pretty impressive on this cheap phone. Okay, then we go further, a bunch more colors, to be nice, uh, to be honest, pretty nice colors. Even more shots here, some landscape ones. These are the reasons why the wide angle was invented. Not as wide as I would have expected and created a bit of a tunnel effect. I'm very happy that the sky was well calibrated. There are even some pricier phones who cannot calibrate the sky. And this is the panorama. All in all, a very similar experience with the Galaxy A40 and A50. The wide angle camera, underwhelming. Selfie focus a bit above my expectations. And of course, I even caught a Ferrari on camera. Once again, difference, regular shot, wide angle shot catching more of the images around you. I even have some blurred images, so not perfect all the time. And I even tried out some close-ups of flowers. I had to struggle a bit to focus, but when I did, the results were pretty strong for a $150 phone. In the end, about 85% of the Galaxy A40 experience is here, even with the minus of the wide angle camera and the plus of the selfie focus. Now, let's see how we did during the night time. Obviously, expectations were low. And some of the shots were a bit ghostly, a bit dark. Uh, it cannot face the lights very well. As you can see here, we have uh, huge street light halos. And oddly enough, I found the colors of the wide angle shots better than the normal shots. I know it's odd, but that's how it felt. Okay, so let's see several more nighttime shots. We have big halos, a bit grainy. Uh, the wide angle shots are particularly grainy because of the lower resolution. The level of yellow is decent. I don't find the yellow to be too orange or too green. It's actually quite reasonable here. We have some mauve lights. I actually had a decent amount of zoom for some miraculous reason here. All in all, it's okay for under $150. People weren't expecting much and it's forgettable in the end, but with some pleasant surprises like the fact that the colors are decent. Now on the video front, I'm going to keep things pretty simple and I'm going to resort to a uh, specialized application for watching video, this one here. We have seven videos on camera, keeping things ultra simple. We got this one with colors. So actually pretty well calibrated colors. Full HD, 30 frames per second, 17 mega per second bit rate. And one thing that annoyed me was the shakiness. All the videos we shot are shaky for sure shakier than the average mid-range phone. Nice colors, nice clarity all around, pretty white sky. And let's go further, see another video, this one here. 
it's filmed when walking. We didn't expect any sort of solid stabilization and it's actually not solid, but at least there is not a huge amount of flicker here. Of course, the stabilization is poor, but the image doesn't flicker. Some overexposure here and there. Another shot facing the very strong sun of a summer day. White sky, although it actually calibrates itself well exposure wise at some point. Not a bad texture of the water. But one thing that's poor comes towards the end. It's actually the zoom as expected from a lower resolution. Okay, and we also did a selfie video, not expecting much, definitely not a vlogger tool, decent at best. And by the way, pretty okay focus throughout. And to be honest, this is actually a video capture that's less refocused compared to what I saw on the Galaxy A40, which started every video with a refocus. It's below the Galaxy A50. Uh, I would say it can fight the Huawei Y series and uh, it beats the Huawei P20 Lite maybe. And also it beats the Motorola Moto G7 Power. So that's the vibe. It's a Galaxy J vibe, to be honest. Uh, on the nighttime video capture, well, it's shaky, it's dark, there are big halos, but okay colors and an okay focus and a lot of grain when you zoom in. So in the end, it feels like one of those older Samsung Galaxy J phones fighting the Huawei Y series, beating it, and also fighting the Motorola Moto G7 and beating the G7 Power. That's my entire impression about the camera. When it comes to the web browsing, we got a pre-installed browser, this one from Samsung. You can also opt for Chrome if you want. Let's load up gsmdome.com. Here we go. This is it. loaded reasonably fast and it's also a good way for me to show you the virtual keyboard we have here and I have good news it's uh, decently spaced generously spaced and it has a numeric row at the top plus quite a few options including vocal input on the connectivity front you're treated to a dual sim nano sim experience there's also 4G LTE here and um, we have the slots separated from the micro SD so it's sim sim micro SD there is no ANT plus there's an USB Type-C 2.0 at the bottom, there's an audio jack, GPS, GLONASS, Beidou and Galileo are in the mix as well for localizing. NFC, Bluetooth 5.0, Wi-Fi BGN and Wi-Fi Direct also check out. The calls had a pretty decent volume and clarity, not on a flagship level, but still pretty okay. And we also did a bunch of tests when it comes to the speed, 4G and Wi-Fi. And here we go. Now, uh, the top level achieved on 4G was 131 mega per second in download and 48.4 uh, mega per second in upload, not bad. And on Wi-Fi, 42.6 over 21.5 in download and upload respectively. I would say that the 4G is pretty fast, even for a lower mid-range phone. Now, as far as the OS and UI are concerned, you've seen this story a ton of times before. It's the same Android Pie with one UI, this time with no Bixby home aggregator. Now, uh, it's okay for one hand use, that's what One UI is all about. Putting tabs and navigation at the bottom and content here on the top two thirds. We also have the night mode, which you saw before. So you press this one, things get darker, you're going to save some power. This bar gets darker, the web browser gets darker, so you're saving juice and you're saving your eyes after dark. We have themes, you have the secure folder, a clean, flat and white interface. It's white and transparent, which is best shown by, well, not only the themes, but also by the widgets. So lots of white, lots of transparency, which is found throughout the interface. If you want to do multitasking, themes are pretty simple. You can go like this, or you can do split screen, also pop-up view, so you can have a floating window, uh, like it happened sometimes in Windows. Uh, now, if you want to go to the settings, you're going to find some interesting things related to security. For example, we have the, let's see here, uh, face recognition is available as well as the fingerprint scanner at the back side. It takes about 1.5 seconds to authenticate and it's reasonably accurate. That's what I'll say about it. Now, uh, you can also choose from the options to reduce animations. You have a smart pop-up view. You have motions and gestures here, you have a game launcher, you have a dual messenger, one hand mode, finger sensor gesture, so you can swipe on it uh, to trigger the 
notification window for example send sos and you can actually replace the navigation bar buttons with swipes on the corresponding areas that's it in a nutshell we have digital well-being if you're being an addict for facebook or youtube and the pre-installed apps are pretty straightforward uh, you got the samsung suite here you got your smart things your samsung health with your steps and calories and sleep and all that and of course galaxy wearable there is the google suite there are the Microsoft applications, Office, OneDrive, LinkedIn, Samsung members, Galaxy Store, Facebook and Spotify as well as Netflix. That's it in a nutshell and now it's time for the verdict. Okay folks, so as I mentioned before, it's now time for the verdict. I'm going to start with the pros and while I'm doing this, I'm also going to play yet another game. So on the pro side, it's a comfy phone, it's a cheap phone with a pretty okay display for the TFT LCD. It runs Asphalt 9 and PUBG without problems, it has a solid battery, perhaps even more solid than expected. And uh, the pictures aren't bad during the daytime and uh, uh, the best aspect was probably the selfie focus and the color calibration of the regular shots. Other than that, okay bokeh and pleasing One UI. Those are the pros. On the cons, the phone is a bit slippery. It's sluggish at times when starting out the phone or doing updates. And um, I would have to say that uh, the volume of the speaker and the speaker in general at the bottom was rather modest. I feel there's a bit of tunnel vision in the wide angle capture. It didn't exactly please me, but it may just be me. And video capture was too shaky even for this price range. Uh, less uh, drawbacks than expected at this price tag. So it's only $150, maybe even less in some parts of the world. This is the Samsung Galaxy A20e, it runs PUBG and it can actually be pretty solid for taking a few bokeh shots and maybe even watching videos for about 11 hours or so. And the photo capture were less burnt than several high profile phones. This has been a review of the Samsung Galaxy A20e from gsnl.com on $150 phone or maybe $150 or less dollar phone which is worth the trouble. This is it from us, bye bye.